Okay, let's finish up. Um, first, actually, before we get to dollar diplomacy, I started out on the last one, so you listen to part of it and I'll review it again. But before we get to Taft, I want to talk about the uh, gentleman's agreement with Teddy Roosevelt. With the Japanese, so many people were. So you can see this. So many people from Japan during the Russo-Japanese War were coming to America, partly because of high taxes, um, and leaving uh, to get out of the area, and they were going mostly to the West Coast. In fact, a lot of them to San Francisco. So many San Franciscans, after uh, the earthquake, there wasn't a lot of revenue. San Francisco had this huge earthquake at the turn of the century. And now the Japanese were coming in, and people in the area were convinced that um, these new, these new um, Japanese coming over were going to create problems for the municipal government, specifically for the school board. So the school board of San Francisco stopped letting Japanese kids go to public schools, and there was this huge quarrel between the two. There was a lot of anti-Japanese feelings, a lot of Japanese anti-American feelings. So Roosevelt had all the groups over to the White House, and they had um, a meeting, and it became known as what's called the Gentleman's Agreement. Um, and the Gentleman's Agreement essentially, because Roosevelt, if you remember from your reading, he's very big into um, doing things because of your honor, and an agreement between men is just as important or just as, you know, sort of contractually um, valid as um, any sort of, you know, written agreement. So they decided. On the gentleman's agreement. The gentleman's agreement was the Japanese uh, um, agreed to stop allowing the huge flow of Japanese immigrants over, and the Americans allowed the Japanese students to go to school. And that became known as the gentleman's agreement, which has been on the test several times. And then, sort of furthering on in the Japanese American relations, uh, one was a great white fleet. As mentioned before, because of Mayan's book, America gets very involved in trying to increase the size of their navy. Um, and under Roosevelt, who was a former Navy Assistant Secretary of the Navy, um, we end up having the Navy that ranks second in the world. And to let everyone know in the world how big our Navy was, he sent them on a course all around the world, stopping at a bunch of ports all over um, the major cities to let them see how big our, our, our Navy was. And it was sort of the color of them when it gleamed off of the... Um, the new ships look white, and it was dubbed the Great White Fleet. Um, obviously, there are probably some sort of racial jingoistic um, undertones there. Let you figure that out for yourself. But the Great White Fleet let the world know, you know, that we were on the map, ironically and pun intended. And that kind of goes far, letting Japan know they really can't push us around, United States around. And then lastly, with the uh, the Root Takihara Agreement, you should see that if you can see it on the board. Um, essentially what this was an agreement to try to forge American and Japanese relations a little better that we would um, recognize the open door policy and would um, respect each other's possessions in the Pacific and try to uphold the open door policy. Okay, So that's the end of Roosevelt. Let's move on to Fatty. Alright, with Taft, as I mentioned, if you can see up here, um, allowing the foreign policy and Wall Street to sort of mesh so uh, Americans would invest, and investors would invest lots of money in um, foreign nations, specifically in Latin America, and then we would use our military to keep those investments sound. So we would send, we would give millions and millions of dollars to the uh, United Fruit Company in Central America. It was huge, very important. Latin Americans would say, took advantage of the Latin Americans. Americans made a ton of money off of it. Today you know it as Chiquita. And the United Fruit Company is, um, has millions and millions and millions of dollars of investment in land. And if there was any sort of rebellion in, uh, by the people in Central America or any kind of problems that would hurt American foreign investment, we would send in the Marines or the Navy or the military of some sort to try to make sure that our investment stayed strong. And then Wall Streeters would back the American claims to military um, usage. And so it was sort of like one patting each other's back, and that becomes known as dollar diplomacy. So you have McKinley, and then you have Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy. Be careful how you say that. And then you have Rose or, uh, Taft's dollar diplomacy. Right? Um, the last thing with Taft, he wanted, 
he wanted America to get more involved in Asia, and there was a railroad going through Manchuria. Manchuria is like this part of China. And the Japanese and the Russians had already had, and Germans already had money tied up in railroads, and Taft tried to get American businessmen to buy up that. And it failed miserably, and it was known as the Manchurian Railroad Scheme. Taft got brutally criticized for it in the press. But it's another example of America trying to push their um, sort of sphere of influence will outside of our borders. And it also proves the fact that America has come a long way from previous to the Spanish-American War all the way now to where we're getting involved in trying to buy up railroads um, that go through you know, Siberia and Manchuria. So those are those two. Now let's move on to Wilson. Wilson is going to originally be anti-imperialist. He doesn't like imperialism. He's a Democrat. In fact, he puts William James Bryan as the Secretary of State, who's a pacifist, who will later actually drop out and resign because he's against World War I. But uh, Wilson is going to end up using the military more than any of them did, more than Taft, more than Roosevelt. Um, and he phrases, well, his sort of diplomacy becomes known as moral diplomacy, that he's going to use American foreign policy and American military to push the morality of American democracy. Uh, Wilson is often seen as being overly moralistic and not really open to criticism or to compromise, as we talked about during the Progressive Era. So anyway, um, this is sort of the backdrop for this, the moral diplomacy. Early on, we have the Jones Act of 1916. Uh, with Bryant pushing for that, that's going to tell the Filipinos, uh, the Filipinos, that they can have their freedom um, once and independence, once they can show that they are a, um, a stable government, and, and in 30 years they can get their independence. And in fact, 30 years later, in 1946, the Filipinos do get their independence. And then the Jones Act of 1917 gives the Puerto Ricans their independence, or not their independence, that gives them the U.S. citizenship. So the Jones Act in 1917, the Puerto Ricans have U.S. citizenship. Those are the first two um, sort of morally uh, diplomatic things I want to talk about with Wilson. But he also has a real problem with Mexico, real problem with Mexico. And at the time, Mexico was going through its revolution. The original dictator of Mexico, from like the late 1800s all the way up to about 1910, was a guy named Portofio Diaz. Um, Diaz, right? Um, and he is overthrown. Um, the guy who overthrows him is also overthrown. And in the end, a guy named Huerta becomes the Mexican leader. And Wilson hated Huerta. He thought him to be um, a brute, a Native American, indigenous, um, uneducated guy that he did not want to do business with. Um, and he was also fully blooded Native American, one of the first ones in Latin America to have this. It was a democratic sort of revolution. Um, so in, the, in Mexico, you have Huerta, who's leading the nation. Then you have two rivals to Huerta. In the north, you have a guy named Pancho Villa, who I'm sure you guys have heard of. And in the, the south, um, uh, how do you pronounce this the first name? Um, Venestanio Carranza. So you have Villa in the north, Carranza in the south, and Huerta trying to lead the nation. And that's the backdrop for Wilson wants to put um, good, good leaders. He's going to teach the Mexicans to elect good leaders. Um, and um, American businessmen are calling for Huerta to be um, overthrown because they don't like that he's very anti-American industry. And then something happens called the Tampico incident. Tampico. I hope you can read this rather than running it for no reason. The Tampico incident is going to be uh, some Americans were in a uh, were some American naval sailors were in um, Tampico and it was a war zone and they are arrested and they were let go and sort of as a um, normal you know interaction between the two countries. Um, Mexico was going to give the American flag a 21-gun salute only if they recognized um, the Mexican Navy with a 21-gun salute, sort of a, um, a military um, recognition. But if the Americans gave the Mexicans a 21-gun salute, that would officially recognize 
Huerta as a legitimate leader of Mexico. He wouldn't do that. And Huerta knew that if they got that 21-gun salute or that recognition of the American Navy, then Americans would have officially and diplomatically recognized Wilson. And Wilson was furious about this. And so he starts giving arms to Carranza in the South as a way to try to overthrow Huerta. Well, this makes Pancho Villa in the North so mad. He goes up to New Mexico, kills some, Mex or some Americans in New Mexico, and a guy named Winfield Scott, not Winfield Scott, he's from the Civil War, um, a guy named uh, uh, John Pershing, John Black Jack Pershing, who'll be the American top commander of World War I, literally invades northern Mexico looking for Pancho Villa, never finds him, it goes on for years, um, and they finally retreat back up to the north. The American Congress, the American people are furious that Wilson is doing all of this without the knowledge. Like he, he literally um, used, was going to use the Navy in Tampico without asking Congress. It was embarrassing. Are going into Mexico, like hundreds of miles into Mexico, spending thousands, using thousands of troops, millions of American dollars, and not really doing anything. And Pancho Villa, who was, you know, sort of been historically pushed up as this great human was not all that impressive as a leader, um, although interesting, like has a weird Catholic Mormon religious tent going on um, that was funny if you want to read some of the primary evidence about him. We ended up leaving. Wilson uses the military in Haiti in the Dominican Republic, goes into Cuba, he's using uh, in Nicaragua, he's using the Marines to land. Anytime there's any kind of domestic instability, all under the pretenses of moral diplomacy. Um, the Americans are going to get so tired of Wilson using this constant stream of American military intervention that in the 1920s, after World War II, they're going to reverse the trend of internationalism, of interventionism, and become isolationist. And so all of the 1920s and 30s, America is an isolationist country at the same time that Germany and Japan are building up their military. So we always talk about the pendulum swinging back and forth. We go from to interventionism and imperialism, and then back to isolationism. And it's going to prove pretty uh, disastrous for the rest of the world because we sit out as two countries are building up their armed forces. Um, so that is um, Taft and, well, I see, the end of Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson's um, imperialism. And now you guys should be caught up. So if you have any questions, email me or text me.